Meet Stephen Neryoff. Stephen states he's one of the people who helped lay the groundwork for Ethereum. He's a savant with over 40 patents in the AI and crypto sectors. Ethereum is the world's second largest crypto product by market capitalization and was the first considered blockchain to support smart contract functionality. What are smart contracts? Think of them as smart code, logic that you can code into an application to do a certain thing. When Ethereum was founded about a decade ago, Stephen Neryoff was talking to one of the heads of the Ethereum Foundation and declined what would today be considered a few billion dollars in Ether, a grand total of one million Ether. This sum is calculated through contributor agreements, expense reimbursements, and other investments that Neryoff made at the time. Now, Stephen Neryoff states his motivation for helping this Ethereum project and not wanting to be paid was due to him believing in the larger vision of a decentralized network that had the ability to help change the world for the greater good. Neryoff also states that he wanted to eliminate any conflicts of interest to protect the project and the people involved. That's why he claimed he wasn't interested in the money. Now, Stephen Neryoff's cause has become something of an issue in the crypto community, so we decided to look into the documents back and forth between Neryoff and some of the people involved in the founding of Ethereum to evaluate how credible he is and whether there's a possibility of conspiracy afoot by the United States government targeting him based upon what he stands for. People in the crypto community believe this is about centralization versus decentralization, and they wanted to control this man and his product. More on that in a minute. Steven Neryoff claims he paid for a lot of expenses in New York City in 2014 due to his home and resources being a hub for the people involved at the inception of Ethereum. In one of these conversations in this document with a guy named Stefan Tuol, chief communications officer, co-founder of Ethereum about expense reimbursement, there was a payment for a large office space and Steven did not ask for reimbursement. Now, some in the crypto community accusing Stephen Neryoff of profiting off of this to the tune of billions, but the documents show Stephen didn't make any money at all. Stephen Neryoff also wrote a check as a guarantor on behalf of Ethereum because nobody was creditworthy except, apparently, for Stephen Neryoff. A guy named Anthony Diorio, another co-founder, would later vouch for Stephen's role, offering house, financial assistance, and more. It was around this time that a man named Joe Lubin, the chief operations officer for Ethereum, had a call with Stephen Neryoff where he was talking about how with cryptocurrencies, there isn't a trail. Yeah, careful what you put in your emails because, I mean, those, you know, you don't know who's going to be keeping those and you don't know. Exactly. And again, as we've discussed, uh, there's a tension between opening, between running a, uh, an open, transparent organization and... Um, protecting ourselves uh, and so may maybe we agree to be open and transparent um, except for everything from 90 days ago and, and uh, past because it's all gone it's sort of like the way cryptocurrencies were you, can, uh, you know uh, there isn't uh, a trail if you don't want there to be I mean look I mean like uh... Now, why is that relevant? Well, it matters because some people think that that is not how cryptocurrencies are supposed to work, that things shouldn't be deleted, that there should be a trace, and there was kind of a fundamental disagreement there, sort of like a schism between these two founding people, one believing in radical transparency, the other believing in you can delete stuff after 90 days. I've had it with all my personal and private information being exposed and exploited by big tech and big government. So I'm joining my friend Eric Prince and I'm switching to my new unplugged phone. Protect your privacy, get your very own unplugged phone. Go to unplugged.com slash OMG. That's unplugged.com slash OMG. Take your privacy back, unplugged.com slash OMG. OMG. Now, around the same exact time of that phone call, which was recorded, Joseph Lubin sent Stephen Neryoff an email about leadership discussions of employees versus volunteers. It appears Joseph Lubin was giving Stephen a heads up. They would take away his access to his Ethereum email, cutting Stephen Neryoff off from the Ethereum Foundation in about 2016. Stephen then followed up 
that his email was disconnected. He sent this email to the executive director of Ethereum Foundation saying his email was disconnected and explained how he structured the entire deal at Ethereum's conception. Then in January of 2018, a company called Consensus, a company founded by Joe Lubin's company and Stephen Naryoff, started to go on a public relations campaign against Stephen Naryoff with Evan Van Ness, an officer of Ethereum, claiming in an email newsletter that Stephen Naryoff is not a co-creator of Ethereum. We reached out to Van Ness for comment this week and received a response. In fact, Van Ness sent O'Keefe Media Group screenshots that Stephen Naryoff made to Democratic Senator from Rhode Island, Sheldon Whitehouse. Van Ness wrote to O'Keefe Media Group via X, quote, I don't know about you, but general experience with partisan left-wingers is that they are less than honest. Hmm. Van Ness is calling Stephen Naryoff a partisan left-winger. We find that odd, and we find that interesting given Naryoff is hanging around a bunch of right-wingers and we believe supports Donald Trump. Naryoff told us, and I'm paraphrasing, that he donated to Sheldon Whitehouse in order to develop crypto relationships in Rhode Island, though we can't confirm that to be true. Now let's go to June 2018. Bill Hinman, who at the time was the Director of Corporate Finance at the Securities and Exchange Commission, was working on a new legal framework to decide which cryptocurrencies would be classified as securities. The Independent Securities and Exchange Commission is a government agency which enforces the law against market manipulation. In his now infamous speech in the crypto community, Hinman declared that Ether, Ethereum, was not a security which was seen as a green light for the project and which some in the crypto community call a free pass. Money then started to pour into Ethereum as a result of this regulatory clarity. This is apparently the heart of the philosophical dispute between Steven Naryoff and basically other people. If a network is sufficiently decentralized, it doesn't need disclosures that a security would require as it operates without a central authority controlling its operations. This Decentralization is also what distinguishes utility tokens from securities, as they are not tied to a central entity's profits or efforts. Ethereum's token Ether operates under the concept of a utility token. Stephen Naryoff claimed it was a digital product, meaning it has use, like a stamp. You have to use Ether in order to interact with the network, sending assets, building applications. But if you buy too much of it, some argue, it loses its status as a product and it becomes a security. But this is where people in the crypto community think there is a concerted effort for the powers that be to go after an individual who wanted to keep Ethereum decentralized for the greater good. They wanted to control him, so therefore they came after him. Now we get to the good part. Steven Naryoff and his allies allege that Joe Lubin, the COO, appeared to want to buy Ethereum as much as he could without it becoming a security. And that's evidenced by this deceptively vague language in the terms of service that Joe Lubin is alleged to have written himself. The lawyers made Lubin change it back. Notice he used the word discouraged instead of prohibitive for speculation purposes. Naryoff then claims that Lubin tried to capture the network. Now, we've called and texted Joe Lubin for comment this week and received no response. We look forward to speaking with him, perhaps on our show on the inside. Vitalik Buterin from Ethereum Foundation put out a roadmap for next year called The Purge, which deletes all data that's older than one year. Bitcoin is immutable, and many believe this is fundamental to cryptocurrency. So the question remains, why delete history unless you're trying to hide something? Skeptics argue it goes against the core tenet of blockchain, again, this immutability aspect. Vitalik Buterin, who is a Canadian computer programmer, is dubbed as the founder of Ethereum. In 2021, Vitalik says that Stephen, well, he's problematic. Stephen is definitely a separate case. Like, uh, Ethereum before about 2015, like, there, there's definitely, you know, the founding team, and the founding team had like a lot of characters that today I definitely don't approve of. And at the time I had no idea how to even like tell apart good people, good people from bad people. Um, and pretty much everyone seemed reasonable to me. And so like at the time I definitely didn't have the ability to kind of 
detect the problems in someone like Stephen Neryov. And I think since then, the Ethereum Foundation has gotten much better um, since then. We've also called and texted Vitalik, and he did not respond by the time of this airing of the story. We look forward to talking to him on our show on the inside. We're waiting to hear from you. Given the success of the Ethereum ICO in May of 2017, an individual named Simon Yu asked Stephen to do an ICO for a company called Storm X, worth about 2.25 billion Ethereum. Now, this new deal in November of 2017 was based upon a mutual misunderstanding in the first deal that they struck in July of that year. The government would later claim that Stephen Nuderoff extorted better terms, but emails showed that both sides had made mistakes in the first deal and it had to be redone. Then, in September of 2019, the FBI obtained an arrest warrant, but not a search warrant. Stephen Neryoff alleges the FBI searched his house, went through boxes, looked through documents. Stephen alleges the FBI put him in a van and told him, you're not going to see your kids for decades. They wanted information on the who's who in the crypto world. Now, sitting on the floor of the van, Stephen was told by FBI agents, quote, we want dozens of convictions. In a declaration, March 30th of 2018, Simon at this company, Storm X, agrees to provide Stephen with 10,000 Ethereum secured against 70 million loyalty bonus tokens Steve was to receive in addition to the 2.25 billion he was entitled to. Steve had to surrender 350 million of the 700 million tokens he was due to receive under the loyalty program. Steve could repay the Ether or have Storm X take the collateral. There were no set terms on repayment, and the loan was interest-free. To make things more nefarious and complicated, meet this man named Michael Halady, who used the alias Michael Peters, at various times falsely claimed to be a former member of the United States military, a former government agent who had worked for the NSA, the National Security Agency, the FBI, and the CIA. Halady was hired by Stephen Neryoff to be a consultant to him, to do background checks and other work regarding other people. This is all in court documents in this case. There you can see them. And there you see a photo of Michael Halady. Halady had sent a message to the folks at Stormax saying that we're gonna sue you. Halady also said he would, quote, destroy your community, which Stephen Neryoff team claims is just an ugly metaphor, perhaps a figure of speech, but was not exactly extortion. Nevertheless, in this document filed under seal, an FBI agent in the Eastern District of New York named Jordan R. Anderson said it was extortion. Neryoff stated, in sub and substance, that if John Doe and Jane Doe did not agree, then Neryoff would, among other things, sabotage the crowd sale, destroy the company. Also, this Haledi character, who had very bizarrely told others that he had been shot and killed people and taken down a head of state. He also said he was part of the Irish Republican Army. Very strange. It's a mystery who this man really is and why he involved himself with Stephen Neryoff in the first place. Neryoff claims this Haledi guy was hired to again assist him. But he became a sort of agent provocateur, the argument goes, to cause issues that the government could then use against Stephen Neryoff. In May of 2018 at the Hilton Hotel in Manhattan, Steve Halady and this other person, Ari Yu, held a meeting that was surreptitiously recorded. In a transcript of that recording, Neryoff goes back and forth with this Peters Halady guy in front of Yu, an executive at Storm X. Now in the transcript here it says, I did not call threatening to destroy, but I do recall Michael Halady did. The FBI stated in their sworn statement, that Neryoff affirmed that he knew of Michael Halady's quote-unquote threat to destroy. And Michael Peters, a.k.a. Michael Halady, said, yes, I did. Now, Neryoff says he never threatened anybody, Storm X, and the allegations against him weren't true. But the government did charge Stephen with a crime and named Halady as his co-conspirator based upon the text message that was sent by Halady, apparently unbeknownst to Stephen, but on his behalf. Stephen was charged with extortion. The government said he forced them to negotiate the original deal. But the court eventually granted the government's motion to dismiss the case against Stephen. 
with the judge saying the government concedes that it is unable to prove the charges in the indictment beyond a reasonable doubt. So federal judge Margot K. Brody dismissed the indictment with prejudice. The government's goal, many in the crypto community now believe, was at any cost to capture a top figure in the crypto industry by putting pressure on this Stephen Nurioff guy to turn over evidence about other leaders in the crypto industry. Now, as an aside, the FBI raided my journalists' homes, and many believe that the true purpose behind that was to get access to my phone to know who I was talking to, these sources inside the government that I'm talking to, and to chill those people out, which is an egregious violation of my First Amendment rights. This might be a parallel we don't know. Stevens' case, many in the crypto community allege, highlights a multi-agency coordinated effort to prosecute a, what they would consider to be whistleblower, for a crime they fabricated. And we must ask ourselves why they would fabricate that crime. Could it be a conspiracy to monopolize crypto by the government on behalf of nefarious interests, as well as an unprecedented fraud of the public conducted by these same parties through crypto? An effort to control an individual who, while flawed, possesses certain key virtues to keep the network decentralized? Or is it just a guy who may have done something, perhaps, while not illegal, perhaps strange or wrong on some level? And or maybe this is a guy who surrounded himself with the wrong people. Or maybe all of the above is true. We're not exactly sure. But we're digging into this further. And we look for sources with documents and evidence like the ones we've aired in this video who can corroborate perhaps the next installment and perhaps the more important question, which involves allegations of connections to the Chinese Communist Party and the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission's involvement in what some are calling regulatory capture. Stay tuned for the next edition of On the Inside. In today's unpredictable world, it's all about being prepared for who knows what they have in store for the next pandemic. Our friends and supporters at The Wellness Company have designed this unique prescription-based medical emergency kit that is packed with eight potentially life-saving prescription-only medications, including z pact and Ivermectin. Save $45 per kit when you order using the code OMG. Go to twc.help omg today.